This past Sunday, we had a question that was texted in during our live stream. And the question essentially was, you know, how do you respond to somebody who says, where is your God during this suffering? And that's a, an important question to answer. And uh, in this time, you know, for, for Christians responding to people suffering and our own suffering, really, we respond out of grace and compassion. And so, you know, this is an emotional question for a lot of people. Sometimes it's a gotcha question. Sometimes people aren't really interested in exploring the, the question. It's more of a, a trap. But the, the, the problem with this question is, it's a great question. It's an important question. We must answer the question. But the problem is, um, you have to get into some philosophical ideas and you have to explore things at a different level that are pretty detached from the emotional pain of the suffering that people are facing right now. And so an answer to this question could, can, unfortunately might feel a bit out of step with our current moment and what's happening. Yet, if we don't answer this question, it actually holds many people back. Even, even Christians can doubt, have doubts about their faith, but also unsure how to dialogue and talk to people um, about their faith in, in the midst of, of suffering. Because if, if God is good and, and he's powerful, then why would he allow this suffering to happen? This is probably the, the biggest barrier to people actually believing in God is the existence of evil and suffering. So it's, it's an emotional question, but it's also a philosophical question. And the problem with the philosophical side is that it's kind of sterile and a bit uncaring, you know, because it's not really entering into the pain. So I just want to say right now, if you're facing suffering or you know someone who's facing suffering, like this may not be the video for you right now. Like especially, you know, don't don't share this with somebody who's in the midst of suffering. Like this is not going to comfort them. Um, as believers, our first impulse should be just to relieve people's pain and comfort, to encourage them, to build them up, to pray for them, to share the good news of Jesus with them. We don't need to be getting into all these philosophical things because um, actually, even though there are good answers to this question, in the end, there's still a lot of mystery. And I think that's actually a more appropriate place in the face of suffering is to say, I don't fully understand this. I don't know, but I know that I do believe that God is good. And and that's that's how I'd answer that. And that's because I believe that. Um, if somebody is coming at this from a perspective, like if you're somebody who's, it's more of a gotcha question, like where is your God during this time of suffering? Let me just, on the, on the onset, just, just throw this out there if it helps. Um, I know a lot of people struggle to believe in God. They find it just impossible or the, the way that the God of the Bible is framed, like the, they find that, that that difficult to believe in. Um, but I think, you know, people would say you can't prove there's a God. And I would say that's true. You you can't prove. You, and what, what people mean by that is you can't empirically prove that there's a God. You can't, essentially what people are saying in our context is you can't use the 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 scientific methods that we have, you know, the the, the, the rational physical methods we have to measure God and to objectively say there is a God. But in the same way that you can't prove through those means that there is a God, you also can't use those means to disprove that there's a God. And actually what that what this means is, it means that it it helps us understand that every conclusion we have, every every worldview that's out there is actually an article of faith. It's a step of faith because for this very reason that you cannot prove that your perceptions of reality are not being manipulated somehow. You can't prove that the way you see the world is actually the way the world is. There's not layers and things in between what's going on and your interpretation and your understanding of it, that those two things are the same. There's no way to prove that you're not just a brain in a, in a computer somewhere with information being fed into it. Like you, you, you just can't or some other version of that idea. You just There's no way to prove uh, that, that the way you're perceiving things is the way they actually are. And so therefore... Um, you know, obviously people use their reason, you know, any worldview you have, if it's, if it's naturalistic or it's spiritual in any way, like whatever conclusions you come to, you obviously, everyone uses their reason to, to, to those things, to conclude those things. But we also use our social influence. We use our intuition. Uh, we, we use our emotions. Like there's all these factors that, that go into deciding on this. And so nobody can claim that their view of the world is just based on evidence, pure evidence. It's impossible. It, it, it cannot stand. And so I just want to throw that out there to maybe stoke the, maybe stoke the embers, stoke the fire for like, Maybe you should be more interested in, in exploring if there's a God. Uh, don't discount that uh, so quickly, I would say. Think of God, compare it to like this, to like a black hole. A black hole, you can't directly observe it, but you've got clues. You've got things that are around it that point to its existence. And so, because this, this, you know, was, was a conundrum in science for a long time until we figured out there are these things called black holes and they're real and they're there and we've got a photograph of one now. Um, 
And, and so think of God that way, that you can't directly observe him, but there are clues. There are things that say, wait a second, there's something big in the center of everything that's affecting everything. How, how do we describe that? How do we explain that? And, and some people come to the conclusion uh, that that's God. So um, think of it that way. Understanding God and suffering is a mystery at some level, um, but there are some good and helpful answers to this. Now, I will say this, that the existence of suffering is not an argument against the existence of God. It cannot be. So there's no logical step between saying earthly creatures experience pain and discomfort and we don't like it. So just because we don't, because some people like pain and discomfort, but just because the majority of human beings don't like their pain and discomfort, doesn't, there's no logical jump to therefore saying there is no God. So suffering can never, ever be used to say, to be, to be used as evidence against the existence of God. The only thing it can be used as evidence for is to bring into question the nature of that God. So it can be used as an argument to say, well, that God is therefore not loving or that God is not powerful. Like either he just doesn't care about our pain and suffering or he really cares, but he just can't do anything about it. He's kind of, his hands are tied somehow. Um, and so he can't overcome that or he doesn't have the power to overcome that. Um, it can be used uh, uh, to, to bring that in, in, into question. But I think that's a false choice. I think the, the conundrum, the dilemma between an all-loving God and an all-powerful God and to say you can't have those two things at the same time, I think that's a false choice that is, is essentially limited thinking. Um, and uh, I, think, I think an example of this would be a parent taking their child to the doctor and saying you've got to get a vaccination. So the kid is pretty unhappy. They don't want to get the injection. They, you know, some in, some vaccinations make you sick for a few days, and, and sometimes you can be pretty sick from them, in order to build up the antibodies. And you know, because the child is unhappy with the suffering and the discomfort of that, doesn't make their parents suddenly vanish. So, uh, but the parent is doing that out of love because they know this is going to be better. There's some there's higher knowledge, and actually, that's a helpful way to think about our relationship with God. So if you think about a child with their adult parent, you know, the gap in knowledge is pretty great. Kids, you know, especially if they're very young, they just cannot conceptualize all the way the world works and all the things that matter. And they think like a child, they're, 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 they're immature in that way. And that's a helpful way to think about, you know, if there is a God, which I believe there is, but if you're imagining this, God is so far above us, so far beyond us, that it's like a child relating to their parent, that, that God would have reasons and un ways of thinking and understanding things that would be so far above us that would, if we, if we could even touch that and even understand that in a small way, would transform the way we see everything. And then we would say, now it makes more sense. Now I understand it uh, much more deeply. And so, uh, but let me give you the philosophical answer for the existence of evil and suffering in the world. And I've got this little sheet here. You can formulate it this way. I've got this sheet for you here. This is something that I found helpful. So there's four statements here. Suffering exists because evil exists. Evil exists because free will exists. Free will exists because love exists. And love exists because God exists. That's the, that's the logical order of uh, these things. Maybe you like this, maybe you don't like this. But the key one there is not the first one, but I think the second one. Um, that evil exists because free will exists. That's the key, is that we, you know, Christians believe that God made a universe with autonomous creatures in it, and that he, the, one of the purposes of that was so that he could share his love with his creation. And so the order, in order to give, truly give, because so the Bible tells us God is love. That's the beginning of this. And out of his love, he wants to share his love. So he makes creation, makes human beings in his image, makes his own children. He was like a parent, makes his own children. And, but but the, 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 to truly have a relationship with God that's not coerced, you have to have your own free will ability to choose to love back. Otherwise, there's not, it's not, you can't express that true love. And uh, that situation, that scenario, we Christians believe biblically, as you study the Bible, that that was exploited, that that, that opportunity was, was taken advantage of through, through pride, through deception, through lying, that was taken advantage of, and that caused our fall from grace, and that caused the whole world to be in exile from God. And so if, if God is good and powerful and holy and righteous and kind and loving, and we're in exile from him, it makes sense that the world is trapped in this this, this destructive force, this, this evil and suffering that, that we're living out um, in that, we're living with the consequences uh, of that. Now, the problem with this formulation is that it can make you think, well, if 
if if all of this is because of God's love, then God is responsible for evil and suffering. Now we don't believe that God is 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 uh, responsible for evil and and suffering. Um, and this again is a bit of a mystery here. How do you reconcile human responsibility and human free will with divine sovereignty? And but it's the same debate within science. In science, it's called determinism and free will. So scientists have this debate between themselves that some believe that human beings have no free will. That you're all your choices and what you do is predetermined. You can't really choose it. It's all just a matter of biology and chemicals and your environment and all that stuff. And so, you know, that's that's determinism. Uh, that's kind of leaning into the, the sovereignty of God's side, that God really is in control and kind of pulling all the strings. Uh, but then there's the other side of to the other side to it as well about free will, about well, we can choose uh, things and we do, we do have some power and control in our lives. And actually, I would say that from a naturalistic perspective and from a spiritual perspective, both those perspectives find a lot of common ground in in a belief in limited free will. That we don't you know we talk about the the the, the balance between God's sovereignty and human free freedom. I think everyone understands that human freedom is very limited. And, and as time goes on, it becomes more and more limited because you have less ability, less resource, uh, less opportunity. And so, so your human free will gets limit, more and more diminished uh, over time. And that's, uh, that's uh, one way to, to think about it. But there is this mystery between those two things. And we've got to be comfortable with mystery. You know, even in science, there's, there's a kind of an incom- you know, the mathematics between uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics is incompatible. That it breaks down. The math doesn't work in both places, and so um, we're comfortable with that. Maybe one day somebody will solve that problem, just in the same way that some. But to believe that somebody would solve that problem one day is an article of faith, because you don't know that somebody could solve it. So if you believe they will, that is faith, and that's the same kind of faith that Christians have. When we say we believe in God, we believe there is a good answer to. The fact that there's all this suffering and evil in the world and there's problems in the world, but yet God is an all-powerful, all-loving God. Um, it's difficult to see how those two things work at the same time, but there is a time and a place where those two things will come together, where we could see it and we could say, that makes perfect sense. I, I, I didn't realize it. That, 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 I didn't realize the nature of things were that way. And, and now I understand it um, in, in a deeper way. But the fact that we're asking this question in the first place about suffering being wrong means we believe in right and wrong. And so if we're focused on evil and suffering, we're saying, we don't like this. This is bad. This is wrong. We want less of this. Well, that puts a highlight on there must be something good. There must be something good in creation, good in the universe. And uh, that's what Christians hope in. We hope in a good God. And so, listen, the philosophical side of this is not satisfying, but the spiritual side is that even though we believe that God is not responsible for evil, that it was a human uh, uh, pride that, and 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 disobedience that brought about this corrupt world. We, we do believe that uh, even though God wasn't responsible for it, he has taken responsibility for it. And he did that by sending his son, by sending uh, Jesus, by coming in human, by God coming into human flesh and experiencing our suffering and pain and dying the most brutal death you could imagine uh, as a substitution for our sin, entering into it. He didn't have to do that. God could have abandoned us, but he didn't. He said, I, I, I want, I want to honor your free will. I want to honor the, 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 the life that you have, and, and I, but I still want to share my love with you, and I want to receive your love too, because that's what, a relation, that's what a true relationship is, is that you want to give and receive love, and that's what God wants from us. And so to honor that, what does he do? He humbles himself, says, I'll take on the responsibility. I'll take on the burden of your sin uh, through through because uh, you know justice must be satisfied in, in in some regard and so that's what God did that's what Jesus did on the cross for us and that's that's the message of Easter this coming Sunday uh, as well that Christians celebrate uh, in Jesus so I hope that that answer gives you some context you know where is your God during this time of suffering well look at the cross look at Jesus look at his suffering God is with those who suffer and he has promised to redeem this world. We, we believe in a future world. We believe in the next life there is no suffering, there is no death, and that God is restoring and healing all things. But we live in this time with this mixture where there's good and bad mixed together. And some days it's good and some days it's bad. And right now it seems like it's pretty bad. The Christian hope is that one day God is going to solve all of this. All this will go away. And it is a mystery not knowing why he why it's it takes God, you know, why God is doing it in the time frame that he's doing it. We don't know. We don't know. We're not God. We're limited. We don't understand it. But that's an article of faith as well as to trust that God is at work and that he is achieving his good purposes. And therefore, we can turn to him and hope in him and trust in him today. So that's where God is during this suffering. I hope that helps.